Imagine you're sailing down the English Channel. It's a stormy night, it's dark, all the alarms start chirping away on the bridge to say your GPS has failed. What do you do now, apart from panicking initially, I would imagine, is you would start to look for navigation marks and most of those around the coast will be uh, lighthouses provided by the General Lighthouse Authorities of the UK and Ireland. Lighthouses have been around for thousands and thousands of years. They were used to guide mariners uh, into ports around our coasts. Latterly, global positioning system has been used by ships. Another stream of our research has shown that that is vulnerable to interference, so the only form of backup that we have currently is uh, our lighthouses for, for navigation. A few years ago now, some of our civil engineers uh, were worried that because of the increase in storm events, some of the rock towers that are coming up to 200 years old may not be up to the task in the future. So in conjunction with uh, Plymouth University, we had an initial pilot project, if you like, which looked at the effects of uh, wave loading on our rock towers. And from that connection through with Plymouth University, so is our connection with the Stormland project. So the real exam question for us is what effect are storm events having on our lighthouses, both now and in the future? What is the impact and what can we do about it? We're now in Smeaton's Tower uh, on Plymouth Hoe. Smeaton's Tower spent the first 127 years of its life out on the Edison, 14 miles southwest of Plymouth. It's been on Plymouth Hoe for longer than that now, and if it wasn't remarkable enough to build a lighthouse on a sea-swept rock, equally remarkable for the powers that be to take it down and rebuild it here as a landmark on Plymouth Hoe, where it's become an icon for Plymouth and the region. This was his pioneering building, really. He was the first man to call himself a civil engineer. He looked at what, what had gone before, and he, he learnt from what had gone before. He could see what the strengths were, what the weaknesses were, and, and his design took that on board. And I think that's what you know, deems him a civil engineer, somebody that, that learns from the past and also takes technology forward into the future. So in about 2010, um, Plymouth University was approached. Trinity House had had some interesting anecdotal evidence from their maintenance engineers um, on station during storms. So on, on the basis of those reports, um, Trinity House wanted to understand how um, such a massive structure could vibrate like that. Uh, as coastal engineers, we understand something about the wave transformation on more typical structures like seawalls and breakwaters. But on these cylindrical type structures, there's a, a, a real lack of information and knowledge. And so what we needed to understand was something about the, the wave transformation over the rocky reefs that surround the lighthouses, and then the structural response of the structure itself to that wave loading, and that hadn't been done before. After the results of the, the pilot project on the Eddystone Lighthouse, uh, we put together a much larger project um, called the, the Storm Lamp Project, covering everything from numerical modelling through to small-scale physical testing to actually field investigations. So it's been great to bring all those together. Myself and uh, Dr. Rabi have a common interest in relation to the effect of natural hazards, also uh, seismic engineers, and hence there are links with Professor Brown Jones uh, in relation to the dynamics of structures. The aim was to uh, characterise, to evaluate the condition of uh, a set of lighthouses around the British Isles and to see how well they can perform their, their duties um, basically for the next century. In order to characterise a lighthouse we need to do measurements of the vibrations. You don't need a very big force to generate vibrations which we can measure with accelerometers. So for example this fellow here, this can measure um, accelerations down to about a micro-g which is something you would never feel but it's something that all structures are, are experiencing all the time. It's naturally better just to record the response. And as the structures get smaller and smaller, and the sort of frequency range of response changes, it becomes more rational, if you like, to use a shaker, an artificial excitation, to induce the vibrations. And by measuring the input and the output, we can get a better definition 
of these dynamic characteristics. We design all the monitoring equipment here in Exeter. It's completely bespoke for the job and uh, nobody else in the world designs or manufactures anything like it. We go out there and we identify the modal properties of the lighthouse by inputting a force into the top of the tower using one of our shakers in, in, from the lab. The accelerometers measure um, accelerations in, in the X and Y axis, which we were then able to translate into displacement so we can see how many millimetres it's moving and twisting. I got a call one day um, as the project was just starting off. Um, what size flight suit requirements do you have? Um, and are you available next Monday to go on a helicopter? Uh, well, yes, I am. <laughs> I have no idea what size flight suit I require. Logistically, it's particularly difficult. We have to carry the equipment up and down the ladders. Um, some of the kits are 52 and a half kilos. It's, it's, it's physical. And things that take um, perhaps two hours in the lab to do a full suite of tests will take us all day on the lighthouse. So uh, one of the more challenging aspects has been the, um, the, the modal testing out in the field. Um, some of the uh, issues with, um, with poor weather, either cancelling trips or meaning that some of our team have been stuck on lighthouses for a number of days um, and I felt quite responsible when they can't get home. Uh, we are here in the Coast Lab. Uh, it's our main facility for coastal engineering, offshore engineering, renewable energy. Yeah, the idea is just to start with a simple and um, quite generic uh, model, physical modeling of the lighthouse in which uh, we try uh, to mm, model the shoal and the extreme wave that are generated offshore. During uh, wave flume testing, we are fixing uh, the cylinder in the middle of uh, one of these wave flumes. As you see here, it is a simple uh, like metal cylinder. And here you can see that uh, we have several holes in this one. And uh, so each hole, we are fixing a pressure transducer to measure the impact pressure due to uh, extreme waves. And then the final step will be just uh, going to the, our biggest facility, the ocean basin. And then I, I try to identify the way in which the waves interact with the lighthouse. It is fascinating to look at the original drawings uh, of the uh, design of the lighthouses um, because we can really see the evolution of the design. This technique and technology that Smeaton developed uh, was taken up uh, about 50 years later by um, another family of lighthouse builders, the Douglas, which developed uh, the majority of the lighthouses in between the south of Cornwall and the Scillies. The biggest and most difficult feat of construction in this period was the realization of Wolf Rock. Here we can see in this drawing the use of dowels uh, between different vertical cores as well as the use of the dovetails between the courses. The real secrets of this building are hidden in its shape and within the masonry of the building. All the stonework is carefully shaped and jointed one block to another with a Purbeck marble joint stone inserted on the vertical joints and a joggle stone, a bricks shaped piece of Plymouth limestone in the top face of the stone which then links to the two stones above in the next course. What is also very fascinating about this drawing is that they are dripping with uh, information about the geometry and construction of the uh, lighthouses. So we are then in a position to recreate these structures virtually on a computer-aided uh, design or drawing uh, package and then from there develop the structural models and the computerized analysis that we need to understand their uh, structural response to waves. This is like a, a, a quite accurate uh, representation of the geometry because we had uh, amazing uh, details of uh, the archive drawings. However, having just the geometry is not enough. We have to make this uh, model of the structure to behave like the real structure. And uh, here were uh, the, the on-site data uh, 
that uh, Exeter University gathered. We have to make uh, the, the behavior of uh, this model uh, match the behavior of the, the real one. Uh, then Plymouth University provides uh, uh, the data of uh, how strong the wave impact can be, uh, the duration of the impact and uh, also the portion of the, the lighthouse where the, the wave impacts. The knowledge that we are uh, obtaining here in this project can be used for uh, better designing uh, uh, future uh, structures that are impacted by similar uh, uh, wave impacts. However, our uh, main concern is uh, what will happen if uh, an even uh, uh, stronger impact uh, in a higher uh, position comes. This is a wave that can happen uh, once in uh, 250 years. These guys were building uh, amazing structures and actually we have seen that uh, this has uh, uh, saved the, the lighthouses. Storm Lamps provided a, a fantastic opportunity to bring together engineers of different disciplines um, to try and um, solve some of the problems associated with the, the wave loading on rock lighthouses. We're hoping that um, um, we can also lead the way in the international sphere with the International Association of Lighthouse Authorities adopting some of this um, modelling and monitoring that we're doing as part of Stormlamp. It's fascinating just because uh, that structure is still there and they, was, they weren't designed with our tool, our computer uh, or our knowledge. Because the lighthouses have been there for 200 years, we know that they are inherently, that they have been resilient. So studying them in respect to what might be the threat of the future can give us a compass and a benchmark in respect of how substantial is this threat and can give us a very, very important insight in how we should develop future structures at sea. The project will help us to decide what we do with our uh, assets, our lighthouses in the future. So it will either tell us um, that they're fit for purpose and they're going to last, say, I don't know, another 200 years, or that actually we need to do something about them. Traditionally, people have always delved into records, but here we're applying modern engineering techniques and measuring equipment to studying the actual buildings that were put up, in some cases over 150 years ago, uh, and learning things about those buildings that are also helping us to plan buildings in the future. It's great stuff.